Hi, and uh, welcome to chapter 14. Uh, chapter 14 is uh, a little bit more about the financial system. So remember the financial system is these guys over here, the savers. Uh, these are the people who have income left over at the end of the time period. And the investors, these are the people over here who, who uh, purchase physical or human capital, right? They send them money and they get back some return. We generally think of that as a percentage rate. This is this this whole idea here is called the financial system. Um, it can be uh, stocks or bonds or banks or mutual funds. There's a number of things that can be in the middle between these two guys and depending upon the way they, they interact, but uh, that's, that's the financial system as a whole. What we're gonna do is analyze kind of the decision-making processes of savers and investors uh, in this chapter and kind of think a little bit more about how they make this decision whether or not to save. So remember the financial system coordinates savings and investment. The the people in, in this financial system, the savers and the investors, they um, make uh, decisions on how much to save and how much to, the investors then make the decision on how much to loans to take and how much to invest. Um, and uh, And they do this on different time periods. In general, uh, it's called finance. It's the branch of economics that studies this decision making. Okay, first of all, we have to think about the present val time value of money because the fact of the matter is, is that when the saver sends money over here to the investor, the investor sends money back in the form of a return, but it's not the same time period, right? If this is now, right? Oh, that should say now. Then this is maybe one year later. Okay, so but basically what's, what we're going to have to do is, is uh, start a framework that's going to allow the saver to make a decision between, hmm, do I want to give $100 now? Is, is $100 now worth blank dollars in one year? And that framework is called the present value, okay? So anytime we're going to compare sums, this word here is from the textbook, but it just means quantities, okay? Anytime we're going to compare quantities from different times, we have to use the concept of present value. We Anytime in economics that there is um, a, a dollar value in another time period, we just move it into present day. And that's what we're going to do here. So the present value of a future dollar value is the amount that would be needed today to give me that same future amount um, at whatever interest rate there is going on right now. Okay, so the opposite of that is the future value. So I have some money today. I want to know what it's worth in the future. That's called the future value. All right, so let's do a simple deposit. Now, we're going to imagine that we are right now are the savers. So we're going to put money in the bank, and this is their decision-making process, right? We're going to deposit $100 in the bank at 5% interest. What's the future value of this amount? Well, in one year, this is very simple. I just take 1 plus 5% interest, so it's 1.05. I multiply it times the original present value, and I get $105 in one year. Now, in the in two years, uh, it's actually worth uh, even more. Now, I want you to note that it went up $5 in this year, but it went up more. It went up $5.25 in this year. That's because in this year, you earned not only the $5 interest on your original principal of the $100, but you also earned a little bit of interest on this extra $5 here. So you have interest on your interest. That's called compounding, and it, get, and it starts growing, right? 115.76 in general, in N years, the future value is equal to $100 times 1 plus 5% to the N power. Okay, now uh, that we have this kind of generalized idea, let's fully generalize it. Since $100 is the present value, we can rewrite it to be the future value equals future value equals the present value 1 plus the interest rate to the number of years. Now you need to memorize that formula because that is um, how I transfer between future value and present value. Now if, um, like I said earlier, we always want to move dollars into the today's time, that means I'm going to need to solve this out for present value and get present value all by itself. It's very easy. I divide both sides by 1 plus r to the n, and I have this formula. And this is actually really quite useful. Um, it, it takes any future value of money and it puts it in today's values term. That's what I always have to do in economics. So let's go ahead and use that formula, and we're going to pretend now not we're the savers, but we're the investors. We're the firms that are investing the money. So I have an uh, interest rate of 6%. I have General Motors. Uh, their cost uh, to build a factory is $100 million. However, they will be able to perhaps sell that for $200 million in 10 years. Is it worth it now? So what I have to do 
Anytime there is a dollar value in the future, this 200 million, it's in 10 years, I have to pull it back and I have to make it into the present value. So let me go ahead and do that. I plug it into the formula, I get 112 million. Well, absolutely. The present value of what I'm gonna be able to sell this for, the $200 million in 10 years feels like 112 million today. Well, that's awesome, I do wanna build it because it's only costing me 100 million today to build it, but it's gonna give me a benefit that feels like 112 million today, so I should absolutely build the factory. However, let's throw a little twink, uh, twist in the, um, in the decision. And let's say that uh, the interest rate is 9%, okay? So now, when I go to adjust it um, and I bring that $200 million back into today's terms, it only ends up being $84 million. So that completely changes uh, the idea. This $200 million in 10 years really only feels like $84 million today. $84 million, I compare that with the $100 million that it costs to build the factory right now, and I say, no way, I should not build it. It's just not worth it, okay? So this is an interesting thing that helps us to understand why investment falls when the interest rate rises. Don't forget that uh, on the market for loanable funds, the demand curve slopes downward. So as the interest rate, right, as the interest rate goes up like this, we see a decrease in the quantity of funds. Because just like General Motors, when the investment rate went up to 9% right here, they decided not to invest after all. Okay, so I want you to um, do this yourself. Imagine you're gonna buy a six acre lot for, lot for 70,000. You can sell it for 100,000 in five years. Is it worth it today? So what you need to do is pull that $100,000 back into present value um, if, if R is 0 0.05, meaning 5%, or if R is 10%. And once you pull it back into the present value, then you can compare it to the $70,000. Because you're gonna pay $70,000 for it today. That's a present cost. This is a benefit, but it's not the present value of the benefit. You need to pull that back into today's terms, and then you can compare the benefits and the costs. All right, so um, let's do the first scenario where we have 5% interest. If I bring that back, the $100,000 only feels like $78,350 $78, to me now, but that's still more than the $70,000 I have to pay. So yes, I should buy it. But in the second case, if interest rate is 10%, that $100,000 only feels like $62,000 to me here today, and so I should not buy it because it's less than the present cost of $70,000. All right. Uh, so I, I hinted this a little bit before, compounding. It's this idea that you earn interest on the interest you've already earned. That's why a couple slides back, um, the, it went from 100 to 105, and then it didn't go up to 110, but it went up to 110.25, because the extra 25 cents is the interest you earned on the previous interest. All right, so small differences in interest rates can lead to big differences over time because you earn interest on your interest. Imagine that you bought $1,000 worth of Microsoft stock and you held it for 30 years. If the rate of return is 8%, with the compounding, you get $10,000 out of it. That's awesome. It goes up 10 times nearly in 30 years, right? But imagine you just do a slight change in the interest rate, all right? You go to 10%. You notice that it almost nearly doubles. It goes from uh, 10,000 to 17,000, it nearly doubles. The interest rate did not even close to double, but the, the uh, future value almost doubled because of the idea that compounding uh, um, makes things grow very quickly over time. All right, and uh, in general, there's an easy way to, to calculate this. It's called the rule of 70, okay? Um, if a variable grows at X percent per year, the variable will double in 70 divided by X years. So if you put um, uh, something in the bank at 5%, it will double in 14 years. How did I get that? I did 70 divided by five, it got me 14 years, okay? Uh, if, however, you bump that up just a little tiny bit to 7%, you see it grows very much quicker. It will double in only 10 years, okay? So the interest rate only went from five to seven, that's a small increase, but it went from 14 years to double, doubling to 10 years doubling. That is means it's growing a whole lot faster, all right? Now we're gonna switch gears a little bit and get into risk aversion. This is the idea that uh, most people dislike uh, risk or uncertainty. That's called being risk averse, all right? 
Here's an example. Let's say you toss a fair coin. I say fair because I just want you to know this is just a regular coin. You're going to get heads or tails, just equal probability, 50-50 like you always know. But do you want to play this gamble? Look at this. If it's heads, you win 1,000. If it's tails, you lose 1,000. I don't think very many people want to play this. Why? It's too risky to lose $1,000. Even though, on average, you would expect you get 50% chance of winning 1,000, 50% chance of losing 1,000, you'd expect to make $0 overall, which which uh, is means that it's exactly equal to not playing the game at all, so you shouldn't really even care one way or the other if you play the gamble or don't play the gamble, but there's no way you would take this. It's because the pain of losing $1,000 right here uh, exceeds the pleasure of winning $1,000, and you're not willing to take that pain. All right, how do we explain this mathematically? Well, we create this thing called the utility function. Real quick, utility is a measure of well-being. It's like your happiness, and we're going to go ahead and graph someone's utility versus how much wealth they have. And the idea that I'm going to posit is that the graph looks like this. Why, you ask? Well, I'll tell you why. It's because imagine you're at this point, point of current wealth, which gives you this level of current utility or happiness, okay? However, as wealth rises, the curve becomes flatter due to diminishing marginal utility. This means that the more wealth the person has, the less extra utility he would get from an extra dollar. And same way to think of this, if there was $20 on the street, who would be happier about finding it, uh, a poor person or Bill Gates? Well, clearly the poor person would because when you're low levels of wealth, when you're down here, okay, increasing your wealth will take you from here to here, and that's a huge increase in your happiness. Whereas at high levels of wealth, going from here to here, it only increases your happiness slightly. Okay, and that's why this shape of the function, the utility function, makes sense. Okay, so how does that come together with risk aversion? Well, let's go ahead and put the uh, coin flip example back on here. Let's imagine this is the point where you would lose a thousand dollars. Okay, so you start out having this amount of money, and if you lost a thousand dollars, you'd be here. So you start out at this level of happiness. If you lost a thousand dollars, you'd be here. Okay, on the happiness scale. But then again, if you gained a thousand dollars, you'd be at this point. Now notice that the 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 loss of happiness or the pain of losing a thousand is bigger than the gain from winning a thousand. Okay. In other words, I don't want to play that gamble. The gamble is too risky because it's worse to lose money than to gain money for me. So therefore, I'm actually willing to pay a little bit to get rid of that risk, and we call that insurance. How does insurance work? It's a person who faces a risk pays a fee to the insurance company, which in turn accepts part or all of the risk. Now, why would somebody willing to pay money in order to get make risk go away? Well, it's because of this idea that we learned that about the utility function. I'm actually worse off any time I have to play that gamble or any time I have to accept risk, I'm worse off. I'm actually willing to pay some money to get rid of risk. Um, and this is generally true for everybody in society. And uh, what insurance does is, is a company comes along, it pools everybody's risk, which makes uh, risk averse people happier because they don't have to deal with the gamble and then the um, insurance company actually pays for the risk uh, either the, they either collect the good money in the good state of the world or they pay out the bad state in the bad state of the world okay so imagine there's 10,000 people it's easier um, instead of one guy having to bear the uh, entire cost of his house burning down and everybody else being freaked out that they're next they just all decide to pay one ten thousandth of the cost and then nobody actually has to pay when, um, for their house when they burn down because everybody paid a little bit of it up front. Okay? Uh, unfortunately, this leads to two main problems. One of them is called adverse selection. The other is called moral hazard. Yes, they're weird words. Just memorize them, uh, but understand what they mean. So adverse selection means that only the people, the high risk people, or the, the people who are likely to get the bad risky outcome are going to buy insurance, which is a huge problem because insurance depends on, on some people who are actually going to get um, the bad thing, for example, the house burning down, and then there depends on many other people who are not going to get the house burned down. But if only people with homes in fire areas are, buy insurance, then every single person might get their house burned down, and that's not going to... Um, the, the insurance company is going to go out of business. The other problem is moral hazard, right? Basically, if you have insurance, you're less careful. 
And so what you end up doing is you have more risky behavior than everybody engages in more risky behavior. Maybe you um, play with matches in your house more or something, or you uh, get insurance on your car, so you start playing bumper cars with your car. I don't know what it is. But um, it, if everybody does that, then there's going to be more risk involved, and the insurance company won't be able to pay off on all of the, um, the bad gambles. So uh, insurance companies can't really fully fix this problem, so they charge higher prices than what you would think, right? So they cannot just charge the um, divided up amount of the one person's house who, got, who did get burned down. They have to charge more than that because of these two problems, okay? And so because that some people, um, because insurance companies have to, have to charge more, People who know that they're low risk, for example, people who know that their house is never going to burn down or people who know that they're never going to get sick, say, why do I need insurance? And they they um, they refuse to buy insurance, which is a bummer because it's bad for them. They lose the benefits of getting rid of the risk, right? We're all better off when we get rid of risk. And the high risk people are worse off too because their insurance company is not going to be able to stay afloat. It's going to go out of business because it's paying out too many claims. All right, so I want you to look at these three examples and tell me whether you think they're adverse selection or moral hazard. Just really quickly, um, Joe smoking in bed, that's moral hazard. Uh, Susan knowing that she's probably more likely to have a problem in the future, she buys it, adverse selection, right? She'd be a risky person. And then Gertrude is... Um, leaving the top down on her convertible and that's called moral hazard because she knows that it doesn't matter if people steal her things. Okay, so how do we measure risk? Well, to, without getting into it too complicated, uh, we refer to something standard deviation. That basically means how much uh, the variable can move around, how likely it is to fluctuate, right? So the bigger the number, um, the greater the risk, right? So I have an asset, let's say it's a, a, it's a, it's a um, it's a stock, and I expect that it will return 4% perhaps, but maybe um, it, on average it can return anywhere from 14 to negative uh, 6%, right? So you see on either side it goes out 10%, so the standard deviation here would be 10, right? The expected return is 4, the standard deviation is 10. As you can see, the bigger the standard deviation, the riskier the asset. Okay, how do we take care of this? We diversify, right? Instead of putting all your eggs in one basket, so to speak, you um, purchase a large number of different risky assets. So they're all risky together, but they're all risky on different things. So some of those are gonna ha have good outcomes, some of them are gonna have bad outcomes, and um, it, you will, uh, so some will have high outcomes, some will have bad outcomes, and they will average each other out. So your portfolio as a whole, that's what it's called when you hold many types of stocks, it's called a portfolio, is likely to, to earn somewhere in the middle, an, an average return um, that's a way less risky, okay? So this is diversification, basically. And it reduces firm-specific or idiosyncratic risk, which only affects a single company, right? It makes no uh, sense to buy a bunch of buy a bunch of different stocks but are all that are all from the same company or maybe that are all even from related companies right because if let's say you buy only cell phone company stocks well if something bad happens to the cell phone market that's you're not going to be protected against that it's all going to go down right um it uh diversification so it can reduce firm specific risk but it does not reduce market risk right which means that the entire the risk that the entire stock market goes down together even if you have a bunch of different stocks if the whole stock market goes down together your portfolio is going down so here's kind of the graphical analysis right if i start over here and i only have um one, I only purchase one stock, it's very risky. Maybe 50% is my standard deviation. But then as I buy more and more stocks, notice that um, the as the stocks go up this way, the risk falls down this way. It kind of seems to level out right at about 20%. Now, what is that? What's the reason that it levels out at 20%? Because the market risk. So you can't eliminate market risk even with an infinite number of stocks.
Okay. So remember, there's always trade-offs in economics. Uh, if you buy a riskier asset, gen generally it pays a higher return to to entice you or encourage you to buy the riskier asset. All right. So uh, let's say stocks are very risky over the past 200 years. Um, because they're so risky, they've paid out on average 8%. However, on short-term government bonds, which are seen as basically about the safest thing you can buy, the United States government is probably not going to go out of business or you know stop existing anytime soon, so it'll pay. Um, that's about the least risky thing you can buy, so they only pay 3%. Okay. Um, now let's suppose that you're taking your portfolio and you're trying to figure out how many stocks versus how many U.S. government bonds to hold. right? Um, so the stocks, remember, they return 8%, and let's say the standard deviation is 20%. It's huge. It's really risky. Um, the U.S. government bonds, they pay 3% every single year, and the standard deviation is zero, meaning it never changes from 3% per year. All right. So if you want to know how what my stocks or my, what my portfolio as a whole is going to perform at, it just depends on how much uh, stocks and versus bonds are in your portfolio. At this point, all we have is bonds, so we have 3% and zero standard deviation. At this point, all we have is stocks, so I have 8% um, return and 20% standard deviation. And then here in the middle, you see that as I um, purchase more and more bonds, right this way, the return and the risk both go down. All right, so increasing, if I put more stocks in the portfolio, it's the average, right? It's the opposite, right? The risk and the return both go up. All right, last thing I want to kind of talk about is asset valuation. It's trying to figure out whether a, a stock uh, is, is at the right price, right? Um, so basically, you're going to compare the cost, i.e. the share price on the stock market of the, of the price, of the stock, excuse me, to the benefit to you, which we'll call the value, right? So if it costs more than it's going to value to you, it's overvalued. If it costs less than the value to you, it's undervalued. If it costs exactly what it's equal, what the value is, the stock is fairly valued. Now let's look at how we calculate the value of a stock, okay? There are two ways that you can get money from a stock. You you buy it now and you can sell it. It is, after all, an asset you can sell. And you also get dividends. So basically, the benefit is just the sum of these two things right here to you, except for you have to bring these dollar values, which are in the future, into today's time period, right? How do you use that? How do you do that? You use the present value formula, OK? So let's go ahead and do that. In uh, here's the the amount that the present value of the stocks are going to be in the future. Here's the present value of that thirty dollars in the future altogether. It's twenty five oh three, right? So that's the benefit to you of owning a share of stock for three years. If you can buy a share of uh, that share for less than twenty five dollars and three cents, you should buy it, right? If it's listed on the stock market for more, then it's overvalued and you should not buy it. So basically, long story short, the value of a share is the present value of any dividends plus the present value of that future price you get when you sell it, okay? In real life, though, we don't really know the future price or the future dividends, but there is a branch of economics that, stu that studies this. It's called fundamentals analysis or pricing on the fundamentals. And um, very smart people study the companies to try to figure out what the future dividends and what the future stock price is going to be, and then they make their purchase decisions based on that. Okay, so imagine that somebody calls you and says, hey, there's a, there's a hot tip about the stock. Should you buy it, right? Should you buy the stock in the company? Well, let me explain. In general, uh, economists think in the efficient markets hypothesis, basically that all publicly available information is already contained in the price of the stock or the bond. Now, what does that mean? That means that the stock price already reflects all available information about the company, meaning your broker who just called you about a hot tip. The thing is, is that as soon as someone else got called about the hot tip, they purchased that price, made the stock price go up, and it's already been adjusted before you can ever even get to that stock price, get to buy that stock, okay? So stock prices follow a random walk, meaning they only change based on news, then they change instantly, and you cannot predict really news. So stock prices are impossible to predict. And it, this is the big thing. It's impossible to systematically beat the market, right? By the time you get your hot tip and try to act on it, someone else has already beaten you to it, bought that stock, and, and, and the price rises. So you're not actually going to be getting a good deal on it anymore. 
So that brings up a good question. Should I put my money in an index fund? This is just a, a, a fund that you put in, you put your money in, and it buys a little tiny bit of every stock so that when the stock market as a whole goes up or down, your um, money goes up or down exactly identical to the stock market as a whole. Versus a mutual fund is actively managed. There are managers who try to pick the best stocks um, and outperform the market as a whole. According to the efficient markets hypothesis that I just showed you, this shouldn't be able to happen. So, um, so let's so let's see. Uh, this is what I was just saying. Actually, efficient market hypothesis tells us this shouldn't be able to happen. That that no one should be able to beat the market as a whole. Um, let's look at some data. In these for for large companies, the S and P five hundred is is just how. Um, the stock market as a whole did was 6.2 percent, and then when people tried to only pick the uh, the best large companies, they only got 5.9 percent annualized return. Also, over here in this column is an expense ratio. It just tells you how much expenses are taken out, meaning that here this is a higher number than this. In when you when you put your money in a large uh, managed fund, uh, they take out a lot more of your money to pay these smart. Uh, investor guys who are trying to beat the market. Um, if you look at the medium-sized companies, right, it just playing the plain, the plain old index fund, meaning just what the stock market as a whole returned, 10.9%. But the people who managed them only got 8.1%. If you look at the small companies, you see that this is actually quite a big return. Why is it so big? Well, because remember, it's more risky. These smaller companies are, are more likely to go uh, underwater. So you get paid higher percent right here, 12.5 over the, over the 6.2 from the bigger companies. But even when compared to the managed small cap, oh, that's a typo, it should be managed small cap funds, that is still um, just the plain old stock market beats uh, a, a fund manager. All right, so um, why, why do stock prices go up and down? Well, really, we don't really know. John Maynard Keynes, uh, one of the smartest economists of of our of history says that stock prices go up and down because of animal spirits. In other words, the guy has no clue, right? Alan Greenspan, chairman of the Fed in the 90s, called it irrational exuberance. Um, in other words, there's bubbles that occur when people buy stocks that are more expensive than they should, um, and we don't really know why or how that affects the economy. All right. So in conclusion. Uh, we talked a little bit about uh, financial tools. We talked about the efficient markets hypothesis that says you can't beat the market. And then finally, uh, stock prices do go up and down. It's important, and we'll study that later in this course.